Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm absolutely delighted to see you all here today. Uh, I'm, we have a terrific guest, and we're talking about some really, really important stuff, and I'm really looking forward to a conversation. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce President Lynn Pasquarella. She's the head of the American Association of Colleges and Universities, which is a vast membership organization that includes colleges and universities that are doing some form of liberal education in the undergraduate sphere. Uh, some of them are liberal arts colleges per se. Some of them are big universities and state schools that are trying to do that in different ways. Part of it is just universities and colleges that are interested in improving undergraduate education. AACMU does a lot of great work from workshops to conferences. They publish some really, really powerful resources. I can't recommend them highly enough. And Lynn is in charge. And she is someone that I'm just dying to talk to. She's also recently published a book. If you look in the bottom left of your screen, there's a kind of mustard collar uh, square which has what we value. And that's her new book on how colleges and universities embody and express value and what that means for justice. Now, with all of that, let me just uh, stop my, all my throat clearing and let me bring President Pascarella up on stage. Greetings. Hi, Brian. Hello, very good to see you. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Are you, uh, you're in um, Connecticut? This yes. Afternoon. Very good. So you, you can tell us, what's the weather like there? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's in the right. 70s, a oh. stark departure from what it's been over the past few weeks and months. Ah, oh, indeed. Well, please enjoy. I, I hope you can go outside and, and, and partake as much of that as possible. Uh, President Pascarella, we have a tradition here on the forum, uh, asking people to introduce themselves, not by looking to the past, but by looking ahead to the future. And so the question is, looking to the next year, what are you looking forward to doing? And that is both what, what are, what's the stuff you're planning on working on the most and what ideas and concepts are going to be top of mind for you? Uh, this is a critical moment for higher education. We've seen over the past eight years a uh, rapid decline in public trust in mm -hmm. higher education in general and liberal education in particular. And, you know, that's been part of a, a demographic divide. So uh, Republicans in the past have said that college campuses are bastions of liberal progressivism that are brainwashing the next generation of snowflakes to melt at the slightest abrasion of their sensibilities. They're worried about liberal indoctrination through liberal education. Uh -huh. Democrats have been concerned about the costs of higher education, uh, that it's too expensive, too difficult to access both agree that higher education isn't teaching people 21st century skills. And oh. so much of what I'll be doing over the next year is continuing our work around restoring public trust in the promise of liberal education and inclusive excellence, recognizing that inextricable link between our nation's historic mission of educating for democracy, which is more important than ever, and liberal education. That's an enormous task. Uh, yes. Working with an audience of 320 plus million people. Um, and uh, I, I'm so glad you're doing it because this is so, so badly needed. Thank you so much. I mean, one of the challenges is that there's a, a rhetoric that has been fueled by higher education's critics that suggests that higher education and liberal education especially are mere luxuries that we should be focusing on workforce preparedness, narrow technical training to get jobs. And so there's been a shift away from the notion of higher education as a public good to viewing it as a private commodity, tuition in exchange for jobs. Well. We need to, to push back against that rhetoric. To be sure, we need to prepare students for the workforce, but higher education does so much more, including uh, positioning people for success through the mindsets and dispositions necessary to thrive, fostering moral imagination, imagining what it's like to be in the shoes of another different from oneself, yeah. which is essential for global citizenship, um, and pushing back against authoritarian tendencies. We saw from uh, Tony Carnevale at Georgetown, his recent research, talking about the ways in which a liberal education in particular creates dispositions toward resisting authoritarian tendencies. How 
I, I have to ask with with all of this with all this intellectual scope what mechanisms are you going to use to conduct this kind of uh, massive counter propaganda campaign uh, I mean, are, are you are you looking at publishing more books are you looking at lobbying state legislatures are you trying to identify great academics to have them wave the torch in public what will you mechanically do yeah that's a great question uh, we are certainly encouraging leaders at all levels of higher education to speak out against some of the uh, overreach that's taking place on the part of state legislators on the part of governors and governing boards with respect to academic freedom, the free exchange of ideas, what can be taught, who can teach it, who gets tenure, who gets promoted. Um, this is a, a serious concern for us. We haven't seen uh, this level of suppression of free speech since the McCarthy era. Uh, so we're encouraging people to speak out against that. Um, and we're also, the last thing we need is to publish more books as a way of furthering our objectives. Uh, you know, Michael Sandel and his book on the myth of meritocracy talks about uh -huh. prejudice of the poorly educated as the last acceptable, uh, well, the stigmatization of the poorly educated as the last acceptable prejudice in the United States. And so we need to look at the ways in which our language contributes to that stigmatization that those who haven't had access to higher education or who choose not to engage in higher education are somehow lesser. Um, there is this notion of colleges and universities as existing within an ivory tower as the willful disconnect from the practical matters of everyday life. And so we need to begin by demonstrating that our colleges and universities are anchor institutions, uh, illustrating that their successes interwoven with the psychological, social, economic, educational health, well-being of those in the communities in which they're located and those we ultimately seek to serve. Indeed. Uh, well, well, thank you for more arguments for this and thank you for those for those examples. And hopefully we can contribute in our small way with this hour today. Uh, friends, I, I have all kinds of questions for President Pascarella, as you would imagine, but the forum is here for you. And I would love to hear what you would like to ask. Uh, how can we address this political divide? What would you like to see done? Um, please, the, the forum is for you. Uh, we already have one question too, which I, I, I'd like to put up. This is from uh, John Hollenbeck, uh, who asks, providing or not providing skills, competencies, et cetera, implies that these are things that can be transferred or withheld. Should we not focus more on learning to live in a pluralistic democracy? We should. Um, we believe that the skills that are fundamental to a liberal education, the capacity to cre uh, think critically, to write with precision, coherence, and clarity, to anticipate and respond to objections, are essential to our, our democracy thriving. Um, but it goes back to those habits of, of mind as well, instilling in people a capacity to imagine that some of their most fundamentally held beliefs might actually be mistaken, right. to listen critically and with understanding. Um, liberal education can help people to discern the truth in this ostensibly post-truth era while being mindful of the dangers of ideological filtering that needs to take place not only in the classroom but in the world. There's been this false dichotomy between workforce preparedness preparedness for citizenship and, and what takes place in classrooms. So we need to show that they are essential to one another. It sounds, uh, forgive me for saying so, but, the, but the, that sounds more like a kind of humanities pedagogy. Um, you're, you know, you're describing what we might think of as out of the domain of political science or sociology, um, as well as uh, history and perhaps communication. Um, I mean, is this, is this actually more on the, on the side of the, less quantitatively demanding uh, side of the curriculum, or is there also a role for STEM in your vision? Oh, STEM is essential to it. Um, I was on a, a commission put on by the National Academies um, and of, of Arts and Sciences, and, and we looked at the ways in which we could integrate STEM with the arts and humanities and social sciences. The report that resulted 
um, was called Branches from the Same Tree. And mm. it's from a quote by Albert Einstein, who said, you know, in the face of rising fascism and uh, authoritarianism in, in Europe, that all arts, all sciences are branches from the same tree. Uh, we need religion, we need science, we need the arts in order to deal with the kinds of wicked problems that we're facing. Um, in my book, the first chapter is devoted to moral distress for physicians, talking about the ways in which uh, none of the technical scientific training that they had as physicians helped them when it came to deciding how to allocate scarce resources, who should get the last ventilator, whether they should oh. hold the hand of a dying patient um, oh. or go tend to somebody who might survive, um, how to deal with students, uh, with uh, not students, with um, patients who, who didn't um, have trust in the medical community. And, and so these are the kinds of challenges that we're going to have to confront in the future that aren't resolvable through narrow technical training, but require an interdisciplinary broad perspective that liberal arts brings to bear on issues like this global pandemic, global warming, the what should we do um, in response to an attack on Ukraine when there's a possibility of nuclear weapons, can war be just um, given the proliferation of, of modern weaponry? Um, how are we going to handle the food and shelter insecurities that were unveiled um, in response to COVID-19 as, as colleges and universities pivoted to online and remote learning? And how are we going to address the expansiveness of the digital divide? Uh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Uh, and and I, the, all, all of that, uh, that last one about the digital divide is particularly dear to me as a person. Um, first of all, uh, John, as always, thank you for a very, very uh, productive question. And, and Lynn, thank you for a, a wonderful, uh, wonderfully rich answer. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a, a text question. And I'll give you another one right now. That's coming up from um, our, our wonderful friend and uh, author, Tom Hames. And Tom asks, how much of the institutions and mechanisms of education, which are rooted in industrial age production thinking, created this disconnect? Can we fix that without reforming systems of learning? Uh, they certainly have contributed enormously to the, the state of higher education today. Uh, we have created silos and mm. uh, we have had a system of ranking and sorting. And so at AAC and U, we encourage a, a learner centered approach where each student takes uh, responsibility for learning. And instead of viewing excellence in terms of how people perform on high stakes tests uh, for which we already know the answers, ask them to engage in problem solving um, with respect to the unscripted problems of the future for which we don't now know the answers. Yeah. And that excellence uh, reconceived as a process requires that we assess students at the beginning, middle, and end of their education with respect to the learning outcomes, some of which I've identified. Um, and it encourages institutions to move away from notions of students who are college ready to what it is to be a student ready college, what that means in terms of uh, providing not only access to higher education, but a place of welcome and belonging. Mm. We know about the mental health crisis that is uh, spreading across higher education at all types of institutions. Uh, my colleague, Sierra Sheldon, talks about the ways in which cognitive bandwidth is reduced when students are suffering from food and shelter insecurities, the impact of racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, all of these factors are being brought to bear now on students. You can't worry about your next biology exam if you think you're going to get beaten to death because you're living in your car or you have to take care of your children or parents or grandparents. Um, you know, I think about the, the digital divide again, 68% of students living on tribal lands don't have access to broadband. 30 to 40% of 
uh, Latinx and African American students report not having enough access to the internet to be able to further their education. So what are we doing? I mean, we have to revolutionize and reimagine higher education at this time to ensure that we not only focus on compositional diversity, which is itself being challenged and will be, I think, a further challenge when a Supreme, the Supreme Court makes its next ruling on affirmative action, but also on, the, on auditing the practices we have in place that identify the systemic barriers in our own institutions to achieving the kinds of objectives we have to promoting innovation, excellence, and equity in higher education across all the types of institutions. When you said compositional diversity, you're referring to the student body enrolled at a given institution? Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, Tom has a gift for asking uh, very deep and provocative questions. And, uh, and Lynn, you clearly have a gift for, for answering them splendidly. Thank you both. Um, if, now, if you're new to the forum, um, let me give you an example of beaming someone up on stage. This is Lynn Sibolsky, who has a question. So let's just put her on the stage, put the spotlight on her, and let's see how this goes. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Can you hear me? Very well. How are you doing? Wonderful. Um, always nice to meet another Lynn. Thank you for being here. Yes. <laughs> I'm outnumbered by Lynn's. <laughs> it almost never happens. No. Um, so my background is in college financial aid um, and specifically student loan debt reform and finance reform. So I'm always looking at education from the perspective of where can we get money and what does that mean in terms of input into the higher education system. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Hypothetically, let's say businesses started offering college scholarships more often as a way of, of you know, promoting their business and marketing and so on and so forth. How do you imagine colleges reacting to that in terms of, you know, here's this scholarship money, here are these students who are potentially wanting to work for these businesses someday and build relationships. And now you have businesses coming in and saying, well, I'll give somebody a scholarship if they take a class that features this or if they major in mm -hmm. this. Um, how, how would you foresee schools shifting to either expand conversations with businesses or expand conversations with students? That's such a great question. And I think it is in part the future of higher education. We have to be more intentional about partnering with K-12 business and industry to create opportunities for students. Um, you know, there's been a push toward apprenticeship models, um, embedding career services into the academic curriculum, as opposed to viewing it as completely ancillary. And this would provide a, a pathway to do just that. Um, I expect the reaction will vary um, at some institutions there's been a good deal of support for this. I mean, I think about Bates and their Center for Purposeful Work. Uh, when I was at Mount Holyoke, we started a program called LINK that was intended to connect curriculum to career. But I also know that there are institutions where faculty will resist and say, this is the corporatization of higher education. This is the last thing we need to do. We don't have control. We want autonomy over the curriculum. Uh, what's happening now with legislators provides new uh, reason for, for concern about outside control. But you know, when I was at Mount Holyoke, we started a program in data science with funding from Mass Mutual that, that gave us money to hire a number of faculty and to provide pathways for students. Well, that's, Lynn, that's a great question. Uh, you know which Lynn that is. Um, and, uh, and uh, in fact, Lynn, can I keep you on stage for a minute for the, for the yeah. next question? Sure. Um, and Lynn, thank you for the answer. Um, you can see we cover quite a range of ground. Um, and again, also, if uh, you're new to the forum, we're very nice to you if you'd like to join us on stage. Uh, you don't have to be named Lynn in order to participate. <laughs> um, and gentlemen, you don't have to have a huge beard either. So we're, we're welcome to all of you. Uh, we have questions coming up like mad. Um, and uh, here's one from uh, the splendid uh, Chris Mackey. Um, who asks, regarding public engagement, what's most urgent right now, finding new ways to reach people who undervalue PSE or persuading the post-secondary education community to speak and act more effectively together? Or... 
Okay, I'll be let me put that back on the screen so you can see it because that's a very, very rich question. Yes. Um, it, we need to do both, clearly. Uh, you know, I think I, I just attended the inauguration of the, the new president of Olin College of Engineering, Gilda Barberino, and got to see uh, students presenting some projects that they had been working on. Uh, mm. They were looking at some visual prompts um, on computers and, and trying to figure out ways to translate those for uh, individuals who are visually impaired using a whole range of technologies. And I was thinking about their presentation in relation to a presentation I saw uh, from students at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Mm -hmm. And they were working on the erosion of coastal lands. Um, yes. Soil erosion was creating dramatic problems for people in the region. And so they did a study. They uh, met with residents to try to convince them to engage in certain behavior to prevent further soil erosion. The people they talked to didn't believe in global warming. They thought that climate change is a hoax. And they said, you're just trying to raise our taxes. You know, you're not trying to do anything for us. And so it was a lesson to the students who were mostly engineering students. Mm. That it requires more than scientific training to be able to achieve your ultimate goals. It requires the capacity to speak across differences, but also to create trust. So, you know, I mentioned we're in this post-truth era. Facts don't matter. And indeed, we know now from studies that when incontrovertible evidence is provided to individuals to show that their beliefs are false, they tend to double down on those beliefs rather than yeah. reject them. And so it, what's required is to create a sense of kinship, to create a sense of community and shared belonging based on shared experiences or grounded in place. And mm -hmm. that requires us to be out in the community to not just have our research disseminated among ourselves as scholars, but to convey it in a way um, that's understandable to a broad range of individuals, but also to partner with those individuals in the co-creation of knowledge to take advantage of local epistemologies. And so it is truly a bilateral relationship. Uh, Chris, that's a that's a very, very probing question. And uh, I, I think, Lynn, your your story about Worcester is uh, is a great one. And that matches my sense, both the WPI and, and the city of Worcester. Um, Chris, I, I hope this 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 gives us gives you a, a, a direction for an answer. Um, if you'd like to follow up, please either just, you know, type another question or, or click your raised hand because your your question has a lot going on for it. Um, thank you very much. Um, Lynn Sibulski, I, I, if, I, if I could branch this over to you just for one second here. Um, what your namesake just described had to do, among other things, with relationships that are financial. Um, that a lot, of, uh, a lot of community colleges, of course, are very closely connected to their local community, hence the name, uh, as are quite a few campuses that really take town and gown relations very seriously. Um, is this the kind of... Is, is this kind of outreach one way to build up more and more financial aid and other forms of financial support, both for students and institutions? You know, I'm trying to figure out what is the best way to reach out and try and figure out different types yes. of financial aid. Um, you know, not because I don't think solutions are possible, but because they just take so much time. You know, anything that is a federal program you know, has a whole legislative process that it has to go through. Um, you know, we do have things that are good that exist in the private sector, but in the private sector, you also have competition and you have that potential for corruption that kind of goes, you know, unfettered until things are, are in a really toxic place. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm looking towards, you know, businesses and individuals even who would want to say, hey, I want to contribute to someone's college education. You know, maybe we shouldn't be looking at, you know, businesses that have an, a, a benefit program where we're paying for debt that people already have. Maybe we should really be, you know, shifting the focus on, you know, employees who want to attend college 
um, mm. you know, mm. and for businesses that can't afford a benefit program that covers everyone who wants tuition reimbursement, is there still a pathway to say, hey, I have these two or three employees and I want to contribute something? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and in that way, I think it kind of makes higher education more of a community focus. And I, I would love to see ways of, of having businesses and individuals look at the needs in their communities and say, how can we support the students who are here? How can we get people to be educated here and then stay here and then give back to the community? And I think students would be more likely to do that if their funding came from their local communities rather than from just out in the government somewhere. That's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, and uh, back to Lynn Sabulski. No, back to Lynn Pascarella. Uh, uh, we have a, a response from uh, from John Hollenbeck who who said about your about your story, uh, and he asks, or he recommends, we need to go beyond climate change denial to see what the real problem is. And I'm wondering, is that something that a, a school like WPI could do? Um, is that the can they prepare students for that kind of engagement to say, okay, you think this is a hoax? Why is that? Mm-hmm. Well, that's absolutely right, um, because before we can speak across differences, we have to understand the source of those differences, where this mistrust is coming from, um, what are the the fundamental beliefs at its its basis. Uh, And yes, we at WPI can do that. Um, They have changed their tenure and promotion system to recognize the contributions of faculty in the communities. Uh, The structures for tenure and promotion now for the most part, recognize grants, research, peer-reviewed journal articles, um, books, but but not the kind of work that we need to engage in if we are going to push back against the mistrust in higher education, if we're going to increase equity, um, if we're going to serve as public intellectuals. And, and so it will require uh, not just working with within our institutions, because I know I certainly valued this work when I was a faculty member at the University of Rhode Island. It was recognized um, at the University of Hartford. It was recognized not so much at places like Mount Holyoke, and it didn't matter that I supported it. What matters is that your colleagues and the disciplinary societies uh, of which faculty are a part value this work. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good contrast uh, for those two two New England schools. Lynn Sabulski, let me give you a break and, and let you climb down off the stage. Thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, you can see, friends, this is all about the conversation. And so we, we'd love to hear more and more of your thoughts. Lynn, you, you mentioned um, tenure, and uh, we had a question about that from our great friend, Sarah San Gregorio. She is a uh, PhD candidate at uh, Montclair State. And let me just bring up this question now, which is, what are your thoughts on post-tenure review as a way to regain public trust? I I think most institutions have some sort of post-tenure review. Um, Once you're tenured, if you ever want to get get promoted to full professor from uh, associate professor, you need to be reviewed. Um, Many places uh, review full professors either three to five years um, after they've received promotion to full professor. So I think it's an anomaly to suggest that, uh, as as the state of Florida has uh, and other states, that um, we need to enforce this because it doesn't take place. Um, That's just not true. It's it's part of that that, uh, false narrative that's chipping away at, at public trust in higher ed. So I don't think there's anything wrong with post-tenure review. And in fact, accrediting bodies look at whether there is such a thing in terms of uh, ensuring quality of standards. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's a really, really good answer. And Sarah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, everybody else, um, again, the the podium stands open if you'd like to join us on uh, the video side. And the, uh, the Q&A box stands open if you'd like to join us um, in the textual side. Um, and in fact, let me just quickly share in the chat um, a, a, a chart. This is uh, from the website 538, uh, showing the divergence of Republican and Democrat views towards science. 
uh, which really uh, shapes, I think, in many ways, some of the backgrounds that we were just describing. Uh, and the question here comes from um, our friend Michael Meeks at Louisiana State. And Michael asks, how do we balance the left-right faculty population? Or does it matter if our goal is to build public trust and encourage real discussion and debate? Empathy to understand why others think. Um, we certainly have to have a diversity of perspectives that are offered uh, in, in the academy if we are to train students to think critically. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we have to present false views, but a diversity of institutions in higher education, uh, diversity of viewpoints is one of American higher education's most significant strengths. It's challenging because we hire people who tend to think like we do as, as faculty members. We don't hire people with radically divergent views. Um, it's, it's more important to provide a forum, I think, for a diversity of views. And I'm an advisory board member of the Heterodox Academy, where we are focused on, on ensuring that uh, there's a, uh, there are diverse perspectives brought to bear um, in higher education and, and in all discourse. Well, th that's that's a group I've been approaching for about a year and a half to uh, to appear on our program. So if you okay. want to put in a good word, I'd, 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 I'd love to see that. Yeah, absolutely. I can do that for you. <laughs> uh, Michael, does, does that help? Uh, does that help answer? Does that give you a, 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 a sense of it, of uh, academia as a place where the kind of left right balance can be struck and, and wrangled over? Uh, just let us know, follow up with another uh, Q&A question or join us on stage. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, so let me just add that, uh, you know, I think about these issues all of the time, uh, especially in relation to what I was teaching. I was teaching courses in medical ethics, philosophy of law. I taught critical race theory oh. um, at a range of institutions and at a variety of levels. And, you know, I talked about abortion and reproductive rights um, whether there was a right to die, should euthanasia and assisted suicide be legally permitted. Mm -hmm. I talked about the death penalty and the use of medical professionals in that, um, whether society's failure to protect people from preventable harm mitigates when the victimized become the victimizers, uh, the questions of death and the meaning of life. And um, I always presented a variety of perspectives. I didn't teach by defending my own views. In fact, students always assumed that their views were my views because they figured, well, I'm smart and she must agree with me because, you know, so that um, I would have felt it a failure if they knew my views. Um, and, uh, so I think most professors are attempting to present a diversity of perspectives and provide students with the skills necessary to draw reasoned conclusions. But the fact is the very way that we frame the questions, what's on our syllabus will reflect particular perspectives, political, social, economic uh, perspectives. Well, it's tricky. The, I mean, if, if, if I mean, some academics would respond by saying, well, we are in a crisis situation uh, right now. And I believe that uh, I'm not as interested, I'm, I'm ventriloquizing here, I'm not as interested in having students uh, engage with multiple viewpoints because I think some of those multiple viewpoints are dangerous. And they might be, for example, in climate science. Well, I don't want to give a space for climate denial, or it could be for gender identity. I don't want to give a space for transphobia. Or if we're talking about decolonization, I don't want to give a space for pro-colonial um, attitudes. Uh, and, and that becomes a strong argument for a class, which is actually you know, clearly uh, aimed at a, at a programmatic intent. How, how would you respond to that kind of uh, thinking? Uh, well, I mean, we can't make any progress as a society in working toward uh, shared solutions if we don't understand the other points of view. And so this is some of the controversy on college campuses that I talk about in the second chapter of my book on, on freedom of expression, yeah. where there's often a tension between uh, providing a safe and equitable learning environment that, that is free from stigmatization and psychic harm um, and the foundation of American higher education, which is the free exchange of ideas and the unfettered pursuit of the truth. 
But that doesn't mean that we have to entertain uh, fall, as <laughs> arguments that we know to be false. And it doesn't mean that we need to tolerate hateful speech in the classroom or in the extramural community. Um, there's a difference between uh, academic freedom and First Amendment issues. Uh, we, we have to maintain the integrity of our disciplines and the institution itself, whose mission it is to, to further knowledge. Um, hmm. So th th it's, uh, it's an important question, but I think we can do both. That's a very tricky balance to strike. Uh, thank you. I, I admire the way you answered that. Um, we have uh, uh, another question. Oh, um, Mike, uh, Michael Meeks follows up. Um, and uh, he says, uh, really, John Haidt book, I think he means John Haidt from Heterodox, mm -hmm. every faculty not being able to be open and honest in the classroom compared to decades past. Your thoughts? Uh, if I can ventriloquize again, I, I think, and I'm, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, he's saying that faculty feel that they cannot be as open and honest in the classroom now as they used to be. Michael, let me know if I'm if I'm wrong on this. Um, and Lynn, you know the book, I think. Am, am I wrong? We do. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I think that's absolutely correct. <laughs> there is a sense. Uh, I mean, I know from my own experience, some of the, the books that I used um, in, in teaching, the course materials, I would not use now because they would be seen as inflammatory. Um, so I used uh, Randall Kennedy's book, um, the title of which you know is the yes. N word. I mean, yes. it yes. uses the word, and it's a defense of the use of the word. And I used it in philosophy of law, mm. in the context of free speech debates. Um, I would not use that now um, because I know that there would be protests, and and I think there there are good pedagogical reasons not to use it. Uh, but I would still defend its use under certain circumstances. Uh, and, and there are many other instances of that. We know, especially in states where there are legal proscriptions against the teaching of critical race theory or other divisive concepts, where <laughs> so-called divisive concepts, where, where there are proscriptions against uh, talking about uh, gender identity issues, that faculty are chilled. They are also chilled in classrooms that uh, are on campuses where there are open carry laws. Uh -huh. I would be reluctant to speak about many of the issues I taught uh, for years uh, in, a, in a state where a student might have a gun in the classroom. Uh -huh. oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, Michael, I, I think um, uh, I, I think you're you're both agreeing uh, that faculty, for different reasons, um, will will have um, more reasons not to uh, want to share their thoughts um, and more reasons not to uh, uh, do that. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, that Lynn, that makes that makes everything you're talking about so much more challenging and, and so so much more difficult. I, I, I'm curious when you know Michael. I think is touching on this as as several of us have today. Um, you know, there's the idea that higher education is is, is rampantly uh, uh, the domain of, of political correctness. This is the argument you will hear, especially from the right, that uh, uh, that it's become a massive indoctrination camp for uh, progressive ideas or for extreme ideas, depending on who's talking. Um, but my sense is that you argue that um, uh, that liberal education, as we see it now, is actually a space for an incredible multiplicity of ideas. Uh, and many, many voices. Um, but now I'm trying to paraphrase your entire book, and that's that's just going to be dangerous. <laughs> um, what, what, I, can you can you give us a bit from chapter two here about this, about how uh, you know how how are we actually doing liberal education? Are are we actually a massive Orwellian um, uh, indoctrination camp, or is something else going on? <laughs> I think there's something else going on. Uh, if you are a politically conservative student who um, is steeped in religious ideology, um, you're not going to feel comfortable at a place like Hampshire College, say. Um, one of my sons attempted, uh, attended Hampshire, had a great education there. But that's a, a politically progressive institution. You might choose to go to a different institution. Um, and in the same way, he wouldn't feel 
comfortable at, at Liberty University. He wouldn't mm -hmm. feel free to say the things that were on his mind because he would be afraid of being viewed as an outlier or creating enemies. So we need to, to think about, as I mentioned earlier, the great strength of American higher education in terms of diversity of institutional types with small residential liberal arts colleges, faith-based institutions, women's institutions, um, uh, and uh, community colleges, research ones, and, and HBCUs, HSIs, tribal colleges. Um, and in those places, um, I have found that there is a genuine free exchange uh, with respect to competing points of view. But there are also missions and values reflected in the community. So you have policies and you have practices, but there's also a culture that is, is beneath that. Um, and the values are often reflected in, in the unwritten culture. Oh, that's a very good point. And that's, that strength is little appreciated, I think, in the U.S. That is the extraordinary institutional diversity that American higher education produces. Mm -hmm. You know, circa 4,000 colleges and universities, there's a lot of variety going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, friends, we're, we're coming close to the end of the hour, so this is your last chance to get in a question. And because nobody else has put a question up in the last five seconds, I'm going to take advantage to ask a question, um, which is has to do with technology. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, um, what role do you see technology playing in liberal education? Uh, that, I mean, it's a big question, but I mean, for example, um, uh, do you see the idea of the digital liberal arts really taking hold where you see more people, more students receiving more education, both on the practical side of how to make digital stuff, as well as on the multiple disciplinary viewpoints on how to think about the digital world? Or do you see the digital environments accelerating some of the problems that we've been talking about so far, such as declining faith in higher education? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm asking to to look ahead a little bit to the far future of say September, um, you know, how, how, how do you, how do you see technology, the digital world intersecting with liberal education? Oh, there are so many ways uh, in which it, we must uh, integrate technology into liberal education, just in, in terms of the ways that, that students learn, how they communicate with one another. Yeah. Um, and, and liberal education is essential to in informing the use of that technology. You know, my, I mentioned my, my son, Spencer, I have twins. Uh, his twin brother, Pierce, is in television and film production. Wow. And one day, Pierce came into the, the library of our house at Mount Holyoke when I was president there and, uh -huh. you know, writing a speech. And my husband, John, who's an entomologist, was reading in a book on bugs. And, and Spencer was working on his... Um, a PhD and he has a PhD in African American studies. So he's working on his thesis and Pierce comes in and he says, this is the most dysfunctional family in the planet. And I said, I, I don't think so, but what do you have in mind? <laughs> he said, you know, you're just sitting there wasting your time. We could be out in the world doing things. This is a beautiful day. Let's go out and do things. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure that you have some uh, things to do in terms of studying too. He said, yeah, but it's a waste of time. They're just trying to get our money. You know, these are courses. How is this going to help me to take a course in small group communication, intercultural competence, when all I want to do is be behind a camera? And so, you know, as luck would have it, Pierce's first job out of graduate school was with the Jerry Springer show, where he quickly learned that we're not the most dysfunctional family on the planet. Um, and he called me from the show one day and he said, Mom, I finally get the value of a liberal education. He said, <laughs> I understand why I needed to take this courses in small group communication and intercultural competence because I just spent the last two hours after going out to get ties and cigarettes for the talent, talking to them about their backgrounds, about what they're doing, how they got here. And he said, I now I get it, but why didn't any of my professors ever tell me why I was needing to take these courses? Hey. And so there was a recent study that came out uh, in Inside Higher Ed on how more than 90% of faculty understand the value of general education and liberal education, mm -hmm. but very few of them think that students understand it. We need to do a better job 
at being transparent about why we're asking students to do what they're doing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they are going to see college as a waste of time. There mm -hmm. was no doubt that Pierce was going to stay in school. But imagine not having the money to pay tuition and thinking I could get a job immediately as he could have in his yeah. industry. Um, yeah. Why should he stay? And, and the arguments about you know the long-term investment uh, paying off uh, mm -hmm. in the end aren't very compelling when you don't have a way to feed yourself or you know care for your family. So mm -hmm. I think we need to do a better job at explaining why we have the curriculum that we have um, and and what it will do in terms of students' long terms long term goals with respect to success in work and in life. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great story. Um, and uh, um, of, all, of all programs to work on, right? You know, it could, have, it could have been a Discovery Channel, you know, documentary about turtles. No, it had to be the Jerry Springer show, right? The, the most extreme. Um, thank you. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really, really good answer. I think we're going to have to cut this short by just a couple of minutes. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for your excellent questions and your excellent comments today. Um, it's been just great to uh, to hear from all of them. If you would like to keep talking about these issues, if you'd like to dive into what's going on with trying to convince people either that climate change is happening or to have multiple points of view in the classroom or to try to get people to take higher education more seriously and support it more strongly, we have that kind of conversation on Twitter. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. Or if you'd like, uh, head over to my blog, brianalexander.org. Now, if you'd like to go into the past and take a look at our previous discussions about this, because we've touched on all of these issues in previous sessions, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and make sure you subscribe. Now, we have more sessions coming up scheduled covering related topics, everything from educating for democracy, what the climate crisis means for academia, public higher education, digital forward design, what that is, what Web 3.0 is. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. If you've got something you want to share with us, a publication, a project, some triumph, please just shoot me a note in my email and I would love to hear from you so I can share it like I did earlier today. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, again, thank you all for the excellent questions, for the excellent comments. Thank you for your attention and thinking. It's always great to be thinking with you together. Uh, in the meantime, take care of yourselves, all of you. Be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>